meaning that if the bits match, we will increment match. Match is the number of bits that match. You know, match, you, you remember you have embedded a watermark and there is a watermark that you are going to extract. The match will describe uh, the, uh, the similarity between them, okay? While the count is the number of bits that you have decoded, okay? So match will signify the number of correct bits decoded. The total count is the number of bits decoded. Let me repeat. I see a lot of faces wondering. So match is the number of correct bits that you have decoded. The total count is the number of bits that you have decoded, right? So correct and uh, total, okay? So now, how do, what do we do? We have to go to the, through the same process, right? So for each tuple, given the set D, for each tuple you compute the MAC, and then if the MAC is equal to zero, module M is equal to zero, you go this, so this means you have decoded one, that's why we increment the total count, and then you select the attribute, you select the, the bit, and then accordingly, if the bit is set, say if the MAC was even, and the bit is set, you increment match. Otherwise, you uh, otherwise you check also if it was cleared. You increment the match. Make sense? Okay. So here I'm I'm just doing the same exact technique, but other than embedding, I am detecting. Make sense? Okay. So now there is what what does this technique do? They define a threshold. You know, you have the number of correct bits and the total number of bits. You divide them by each other. Gives you the per, the, the percentage. Uh, uh, correctness, right? And the percentage correctness has to be above a certain threshold. If it's above a certain threshold, this says, hey, the watermark is present. If not, the watermark is not present. How is the threshold decide, decided upon? It's also application dependent. Like if you have a very critical data, you would like to have it in like the upper 90% this threshold, right? Or if the data, yeah, it depends on the application. The decoder, same story, you, decay, you, you compute the MAC, you locate the tuple, locate the attribute, Look at the data, look at the bit, and decide if it's correct or no. So what are the strengths of this technique? So, okay, what are the strengths of this technique? One, it's computationally efficient. Big O of N. All what you have to do, big O of N means, means it will run in linear time. <coughs> Meaning that N is the size of the database, okay, or size of the relation. It, all what you need to do is examine each topic. So you are just going to t test, touch each tuple, and it's all big, uh, big O of n. No complicated. Uh, so uh, uh, no tuple sorting is required. You just go over the tuples, and according to the primary key uh, and the MAC, you can decide on it's going to be selected or no. It also has a property called incremental updatability. It means that if you have a relation, and you have already watermarked it, and then you add uh, alpha tuples to this relation, the alpha tuples can be independently uh, uh, watermarked from the previous relation because all what you need to do is for each tuple test its its primary key and see if it's uh, a marker or no. If it's a marker, you watermark it. If not, you just leave it. Make sense? What is what is the pro what are the problems of this algorithm? So one is uh, we have seen from the first slide in the model that it does not provide a multi-bit watermark. All the operations are depend dependent only on the secret key. Remember, I crossed the watermark. Remember that? That's wh why did I cross the watermark? Because this technique, the watermark is decided based upon the primary key, remember, and uh, the secret key. That's how my Mac is being evaluated. It's not resilient to, uh, to alteration attacks. Alteration attacks means attacks that will alter the data. Least significant bit, LSB means least significant bit. Le least significant bit can be easily manipulated by simple numerical alterations. Very simple. If you take the least significant bits and shift them one position to the right, you messed up the bit. Because your watermark bit is one of these bits. And if you move it, there is a probability that this bit is going to be erased. Or if you clear all the bits, or set all the bits, or flip all the bits, these will not affect the usability much, but they are going to erase the watermark. So watermark erasure is very easy in uh, least significant bits. Then. Uh, this requires the presence of a primary key in the watermarked relation. Like you need, you need a primary key as one of the attributes. And this, this means, actually usually the primary key is just uh, an arbitrarily chosen index. You know, uh, so someone can erase all the primary keys and put his own primary keys. Just satisfying uniqueness, the relation is still valid. So that's a weakness in this technique. Also, this technique does not handle usability constraints. Uh, complicated usability, other con usability constraints. For example, category preserving usability constraints. Let me tell you about that. For example, the age data. 
Someone age 20, this means he cannot drink, right? If you shift, if you insert a one in the least significant bit, 20 becomes 21, and he can drink. So now the category has changed. So least significant bit embedding does not take care of this. Make sense? OK. So uh, go ahead. Is there anything that would keep a second watermark from going? Someone else comes along, grabs this image or whatever, embeds their own watermark with the same technique. Yes, I have a slide for this. OK, let's wait till the end. I, I, I prepared that slide today morning. I, I have that slide, yeah. Yeah, what, what his question is, what if I embed a watermark in, in some picture or some data, and I give you that, what, uh, that data, and then you embed your watermark, and then you go to court and say, hey, this data belongs to me, and then the court uses your key, they find your, your watermark there. How can we resolve this issue? It's a very complicated issue, but I, I have a slide for this. So the next technique uh, is by uh, Radusion, um, uh, Professor Mike Atalla, and uh, <laughs> And <laughs> Professor Suni. <laughs> okay, so now um, technique number two, these are the points. What are these points? Yeah, these are the highlights. What's being used in this technique? For example, one, also we are going to deal with numerical data. Two, the technique is dependent on a secret key. So we are abiding by the watermarking model. Instead of uh, the primary key, the, the tuple primary key, it uses, or the relation primary key, it uses the most significant bits of the normalized data set. We will see what normalized means in one of the slides. <clears throat> so it has a solution. It doesn't use the primary key. Divides the data set into partitions using markers. So you remember the first technique, markers decided where you are hiding the data, right? You are hiding the bit. Here, they will hide the data not in one tuple, they will hide it in groups of tuples. So the, to decide where are the groups, you partition the data using the markers. We, we will see how. Varies the partition. So instead of embedding in the least significant bits, it will insert the least significant, uh, it will insert the watermark bits in the statistics of the numbers. We, we, we will see how. So this is uh, the general model. It abides by the general model. And let's talk about the encoder. So before we talk about the encoder, I want to discuss with you how to hide a single bit in a number set. You have a number set, and you want to hide a single bit in it. If we can solve this problem, we, we can easily embed uh, a single bit in uh, the partitions that we devise. So for example, what's the problem? Given a number set SI, which is S1, S2, blah, 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 to SN, how to vary their statistics to embed bit BI? Subject to the provided usability constraints. So there will be usability constraints, and you want to embed that bit in this number set. We will see how. So, this is the set SI, it's just a list of numbers. I am putting them on the x-axis, okay? Then I define mu as being, as being the mean of these numbers. So this is mu, the average of these numbers. Sigma is the standard deviation of these numbers. C, C here in this, in this relationship, is a constant decided upon by the user. Now if I do mu plus C sigma, I refer to this as reference. So this reference is sitting somewhere here. And you see this is C, standard deviation. This is the, I'm not uh, doing uh, rocket science. It's very simple. <laughs> uh, this is the reference. The reference is decided upon the mu, which is the average, and uh, C places from the standard deviation. Uh, C standard deviations. So I have a reference. So I have now a point. The number of points on the right of the reference is, is, uh, is referred to as positive violators. And these are very interesting number, the number of points. So here, for example, I have six points. This means the positive violators are six, OK? Where am I going to hide the watermark? I will hide it in the number, in, in this number, in here. Let's see how. So here is my set. What we do is the number of points on the right of the reference, what is the range? Yani by how much they can vary. They can be zero. They can be zero points here. Or there can be all the points here. And yani these are the worst case. Of course, there can be bounds that are tighter than this. So, oh, shoot, sorry. So, on, on this side, I can have zero points. Or I can have, at most, the cardinal.